Sí, no, pues. Uh -huh. So, first thing, uh, should I speak in English or in Spanish? Just let me know. Yeah, since there are people uh, from other countries, I, I would suggest, uh, and yes. as it was announced, to do the presentation in English. Sure. Okay. So, uh, thank you. Good morning. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Yes. Yeah, uh, so. Uh, right. <laughs> So if you agree, uh, Carlos, I will propose to start uh, with, with our, our meeting and uh, I would like to start with an introduction uh, to you. So it is a pleasure for me to introduce uh, today uh, Carlos Granja. Carlos uh, got his master's in engineering in the Faculty of Nuclear Sciences in the Czech Technical University in 1997. He got a PhD in 2003 in, uh, in the Czech Technical University in Prague specialized in experimental nu nuclear, nuclear physics. And uh, he was a professor in applied physics in Brno University in Czech Republic. Today, Carlos is a senior research researcher at Advacam Prague, and he is an expert in instrumentation for radiation detection in space, and as well in ion beam radiotherapy. He has led several projects as principal investigator for the European Space Agency, and he has co-authored more than 100 publications. So today it is a pleasure for us to welcome you, uh, Carlos. And uh, he's going to talk about TimePix, MiniPix, EDU, a radiation camera. In fact, some of the schools that are present here, we have had already the opportunity to have one of your MiniPix in their, in their classrooms. And for us, it's a pleasure for us to, to welcome you to, to speak to this audience. Thank you very much, Carlos, for having accepted. And uh, the floor is yours. So thank you to the organizers. I'll speak English and questions. So maybe let's leave to the end. There's not much time. This is a long-term activity. This is the result of a, a wide uh, collaboration, scientific collaboration in, in Europe, based in CERN, using um, technology instrumentation, instrumentation, which was developed for energy physics at CERN, the European Laboratory for Nuclear Research, based in Geneva, uh, where and to which uh, the, the university group in, in Prague, where I did my PhD and I worked many years, is the logo, which is there, belong. Um, these are, uh, the names there are those colleagues. I have my PhD student, Lukas, who prepared also some of the material, which I will show here. The this video he did together with this another student, Patrick, which is a student of high school. And this is the purpose of this lecture to show to uh, young students and broader public audience how this uh, technology is accessible and it's um, valuable and finds application in many fields in applied and basic uh, science in basic uh, research. Carlos, Carlos, Carlos. Yes. So, sorry to interrupt you. Can, can, can you speak closer to your microphone? Uh, somehow it's a little bit cut, the, the sound. Sure. Yes, no problem. Yes. Okay, um, so uh, here I present this uh, device uh, implemented in this, let's say, basic configuration, which is intended for students <laughs> and the broader public, broader audience, to perform um, uh, valuable um, measurements uh, of uh, radiation. Even, uh, even basic physics experiments can be performed by non-experts, including students of high school. And actually one of the people here, I think he's a 16, 17 year old student at the university, the high school here in Prague. And he's very familiar with the details. And he prepared one of the videos I will show together with Lukas, who is a PhD student here in the group of Prague. I just think the organizers and the audience and questions you can ask me maybe at the end in order to make it faster. This is a summary of what I want to show you today very quickly as time will allow. So uh, I am giving you a lecture, this slide material, uh, where I will give a very short overview of the 
technology in particular in this architecture, in this configuration, which is called Minipix Edu, intended for students and education purposes. And then uh, showing you the uh, response or the results that you can obtain with this technology or with these detectors uh, in several or in, in, in selected uh, applications. I'll show you how to operate the mice very quickly. Um, myself, I have two, three devices here. And also, I will show you uh, two, three videos. One of them, the one which is in blue, was prepared just last week, two weeks ago, by these two students. So I hope you will, you will like it. And they will try to show you how to operate the device. The links will be in the presentation, so everything is accessible. I, I make the presentation available. You can have a copy, I guess, uh, through the organizers. Uh, thank you, Rafael, for the invitation and for the opportunity. And then I will, if there will be time left, I will show you, I'll try to show you how to process the data. I understood that um, it would be good to try to uh, tell you something how the data is, is processed. Just very little has to do with energy liberations and some steps, which is actually my main work uh, already together with applications in, in space and in radiotherapy. On the right, you see a little bit of the sequence, the logical sequence, trying to explain to non experts how the, um, how the technology is used. First, you need a device, then you, you need a method, basic method. You need also some software in order to operate it and collect data, and then you need to process it and put it on the right, and then you get some of your results, methods, physics, know-how, knowledge applications, etc. Yes. This is an overview of devices. So the core technology is an advanced, um, highly integrated basic chip, which, is, which was developed in CERN, designed and developed in, in CERN by the Medipix collaboration, and then Mm, you need or is necessary to have what is called readout electronics, front end, back end, and also some software, and then some configurations or architectures appear. So, starting on the left is one of the first uh, highly integrated instrumentation, which we call the radiation camera at the back university group where I was speaking to you. Uh, and then uh, there is a uh, development. Uh, Concerning the application, for example, on the left, you see a special device for the European satellite in Leo orbit, already seven years, uh, also done by the Institute, and then some uh, special devices, which is also an advantage of this technology that one can uh, develop or construct different architectures. Uh, on top right, you see a large device, it's called a large area imager, uh, developed uh, here in the company, in Advacan, where I work. And in the bottom right, you see devices which are highly miniaturized for practical use, including educational purposes. One is in the middle, one the right is highly miniaturized, which I will show you in more detail in this, in this uh, lecture. This is one of the first devices, and um, it, they produce a video, uh, which I would like to show you. It has an introduction to radiation and nuclear physics. It's about four minutes, the part I want to show you. So I will try. It's in English, and let's see how we can go with this. That's a nice introduction. So just a second. So when you will click the material. Yes, and these videos are fully accessible. Let me ask, do you hear also the audio and you see also the video which I see? We, we, can, we can hear it a little bit. Uh, we, we still, we still uh, hear you, uh, your voice a little bit cut from time to time. Yes, please stop me when... Okay, so I'll continue with the video. I hope you will uh, see it and hear the audio. If not, the link will be in the material and then you can review it later on. But the first three, four minutes are, I think, a very nice introduction to the topic and the lecture. So let me try. We, we cannot hear very well the, the 
the, the voice of the of the video. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay, maybe we can skip this. The link will be there. Let's do it like that because I have anyway a lot of material. So, um, so let's do that. Yes, if the audio is not good, so let's continue this one. Okay, thanks. Yes, so the pages are numbered, and here you have always, I try to put always the links. So to this video here in the bottom right, you have it, and you can see it. It's a really nice introduction. This is already a couple of years uh, done, but it's, it's really nice. Uh, okay, and then the um, latest device, highly integrated, is this one, which is in the title of the uh, lecture, the seminar today. It's called Mini Pix Edu. Uh, built and designed by uh, Advoca, the company I work for here in Prague. And uh, it's equipped with a Timepix uh, chip, and it has also the um, um, operating control and fill out software, uh, which is a basic version of the PIXET software, as it is called. And the device uh, is uh, quite small, it looks like a USB memory stick, which you or the student can hold it in your hand and you can install it and use it on your computer, as I will show you. Um, a lot of the implementation is done by a company, which is called there, and they uh, took the, they completed the material in, in a nicer, uh, let's say, form for the students and for the physics teachers. Yes, so if you go to the links, uh, you will find more detailed material about it. There is a nicely elaborated basic physics and radiation physics experiments uh, with basic weak or low intensity um, radioactive uh, sources, which you can find in the place. The kit, in fact, includes a set of uh, several radiation sources, as I will show you. Yeah, so here you have the information available. Part of the kit is this uh, setup, uh, which is quite useful to demonstrate some basic uh, principles, which you can, or the students and the physics teacher can uh, quite quickly um, learn and um, perform themselves. Yes, so you can find the distance, you can use some shielding plates, some shielding materials to understand and to demonstrate how different components uh, of radiation, like charged particles or X-rays or gamma rays, they interact um, specifically or distinctly uh, from, uh, other, from each other in, in matter. Yes. So, and this, uh, this material is, is nicely prepared and is, is nicely, nicely described. And in the video of my of my students, they they try to show you. I will I will try to play you that, and we will see how we go with the with the audio. Yes. So let me see. Let's try uh, this second video. I think even if the audio doesn't work completely, I will play you this this video. It's very short. It's just two minutes, and maybe I can comment later if it wasn't understood. Okay. Thank 
Yeah, Th thanks, Carlos. We we could not hear, but uh, but uh, even though we could not hear well, it was quite self-explanatory. So so thanks thanks for sharing that. Very good. Yes, the link will be in the material, so you will be able to see it offline. Let's say no, so the, the video is accessible. Thinking of that. Just a second. Yes. Sorry, this was I was wondering. Okay. Uh, thinking of that, I prepared a couple of slides to explain a little bit what was on the video. So maybe that will help. So um, what you saw there, and it comes with a kit, it's a set of um, three, four radioactive sources. I copied them here. They are characteristic. So one is uh, polonium-220, uh, strontium-90, it's a well-known source of electrons, broad spectrum, and also cobalt-60, source of gamma rays. And the first one, uh, polonium, like americium, is a source, standard source of uh, alpha particles. Uh, and then what you saw there, I just summarized it, put it here together to show and compare the um, interaction of uh, distinct different particles and the response of the device, which has this uh, ultimate or high sensitivity and wide dynamic range, which allows to uh, detect different particle or radiation components in wide range in terms of uh, fluxes or intensity. So very few uh, flux or number of particles, also very high. Also in terms of energy, this is called the term is spectral or spectroscopic sensitivity, which has to do with the deposition of energy or interaction or interaction of radiation in matter, which is actually displayed in color. Yes, here and also in the video. And then the tracking information, the shape, no, the, the particles or uh, different different uh, types of particles they uh, let's say travel across the sensitive sensor volume, and this is registered in this microscopic scale by the detector, which allows to extract more information about the radiation. It allows to distinguish different components, it allows to measure their number, their intensity, it allows to measure the deposited energy, and it allows also for many types of particles, they call them energy, to uh, derive the uh, direction, no? so the position is on the sensor and also the, the direction of trajectory. And this is a, a very valuable uh, for some applications as I will show later, for radiotherapy or outer space, no? for, for protection of space crews in space, for example, to know uh, where is the uh, radiation coming from. Yes, so here you have, or for students, I prepared these illustrations of this uh, uh, different types of radiation sources. So you can see there that one of them uh, they emit alpha particles, which is one type of radiation. The others in the middle is an electron, which is a different component, sometimes accompanied by X rays or gamma rays, depending on the source. And also uh, on the right is a well known cobalt source, which is primarily a gamma ray source. In addition to the primary radiation, there are also scatter or unwanted in background radiation. So let me show you, so I would like to highlight the level of detail that one can um, use in this technology. 
So if one selects a small region of the detector, for example, there, as I show, so and then one can have a closer look how the signals look like. Yes, and this almost microscopic scale. So here are three signals of uh, the signals of alpha particles by one of these uh, sources. In this data, I use a vision source, which is another alpha, alpha source. And the color uh, is used in, in this case to um, uh, register and to display the energy deposit rate. So the higher the color, let's say to the red, it's more energy. And it's all level. Yes, this is how the detectors operate. And this is very uh, useful as it allows to uh, register and distinguish and analyze in single particles. Yes, this is a very uh, valuable, powerful uh, feature of the, of the technology. And in the bottom part, I show the same information. So it's the same data in this, let's say, sort of 3D visualization where the planar information is on the XY plane, similar to the top figure. And in the vertical axis, I plot the energy. It is trying to emphasize or to display this spectral or per pixel energy information, which is measured in wide range. This is also another uh, most unique or good feature of these devices is that they have the sensitivity, high sensitivity, and also wide dynamic range. Yes. So this is the detailed information, how the single particles actually are detected and the, the technology, the devices, the detectors um, serve in that way as an interface for people, for, um, for a person to um, detect and also to visualize um, radiation, yes, and the radiation field, um, even online. So the devices which are on the International Space Station or also on some radiotherapy hospitals, the personnel or the patients, if you like, they can visualize or the doctors can see uh, immediately how the radiation field uh, looks like. And the data um, is then uh, processed. All this along with these uh, miniaturized small devices. So here what I'm showing is the detection of uh, radiation, different components, the visualization of the microscopic and also the classification, the discrimination, this term we use, uh, to separate the different components using the same detector, the same data with collimators, etc. So there are many, many advantages to this. So here I am showing, especially these three uh, clear signals of alpha particles. And if you notice in the middle, there is a small signal. This is typical signal of a low energy X-ray. Yes, which looks like that. And then you can see that how different the signal is. It's uh, smaller, it has less energy per pixel, etc. And this is the way how the, uh, the technology and instrumentation and the analysis, the methods allow to analyze and distinguish the, uh, the radiation components. Okay. So let's compare. So this is the same plot I was showing you. Let's see how it compares when. Um, one detects um, first, let's say, electrons or also uh, say background uh, x rays. So, this is a similar, it's a bit bigger area of the detector, um, but displaying the same in the same manner. So, the planar, let's say, position information is on the xy plane, the horizontal plane. On the top, it's clear. That's what uh, one sees even from the software from the detector. And in the bottom is this uh, third direction showing the, the energy keeping the same scale. So uh, the vertical axis and the color scale is up to about uh, 5 MeV, or this is a scale in units that we use in, in measuring uh, positive energy. Um, and you can see how these signals from energetic electrons, which were of certain energy, incident and the particular angle to the detector. So these long straight tracks are energetic electrons crossing the detector, the sensor volume at a certain direction. In the middle, they are um, fully parallel. So they just cross the sensor. You can see the distribution, the per pixel energy is characteristic. This is the key message here. And in the same scale, you can see how different, how distinct these signals are compared to signals of uh, particles or these 
uh, low energy X-rays, which also appear here, yes, because in radiation there is always secondary radiation, etc. There are also some larger signals, which um, are also characteristic. We have, let's say, deliberated or tested the detectors, of course, in well-defined radiation fields. This is part of the technology, this is part of the methodology and know-how that um, uh, we know, or it can be described, the response of the detector, the characteristic signals to specific types of radiation. And the plots on the right are also for electrons. It was the same experiment, but at a smaller, uh, smaller angle. So in the middle, the uh, electron beam was uh, per, uh, fully parallel to the sensor plane. On the right, it was like 70 or 80 degrees, or 75 degrees. You can see a single, uh, single track there. So I here I put the labels. Yes. So the, the primary electron is uh, this long thin track on the bottom, and then there are always some uh, background events, and the sensitivity of the detector allows to distinguish these particles. I have to mention that the, the detection of radiation is not so simple as it may look. It's um, relatively complex uh, task. It has, in a way, a combination of um, concepts or parameters, if you like. One is the type of the radiation, electrons, protons, ions, X-rays. This is one dimension of freedom. The other one is the energy of the radiation. If it's energetic, uh, electron or proton or X-ray, what is the energy? The signals are different. And then the third parameter or degree of freedom is the direction. So on the right part of this plot, I am showing you the same radiation um, uh, incident on the detector at different angle uh, changes the morphology and the, the signals, the pixelated signals in the in the detector. And then there are some uh, characteristic signals or typical signals of this. These are these broader broad tracks, so which we observe or they are typical in the detector when they irradiated by the characteristic um, uh, or well-defined source, yes. So this, this uh, characterization of mixed radiation fields is possible with a single detector. Um, to show you a little bit more uh, how the response of the possibilities actually, so here I am comparing data with other completely very different types of uh, particles, um, ionizing, ionizing particles as well, of course. And these are um, ions. Yes, or heavy charge particles, or not just protons or alpha particles, but also uh, light ions or heavy ions. In this case, the source was a fission, fission source. And top left, it was a laboratory low, uh, low intensity source, California universities. And on the right, it was a nuclear reactor. It was used. Uh, uh, and, um, and these are the uh, just example of signals on the detectors. You can see how, how different they are or shows the per pixel energy. Uh, I put these figures in so for there. So on the top left plot, you see a big signal is a fission fragment, it's a heavy ion of a certain energy. And the smaller signals on the bottom, these are signals of alpha particles, the ones that we were seeing in the video from this uh, laboratory radioactive uh, sources. And uh, this longer signal is a duplex so there are two particles incident at the same, almost on the same time and the same place. Moving forward, so this is a collection of tracks I like to show for students and um, showing, uh, comparing the signals, characteristic signals from different particles. Yeah, so these are heavy particles starting with protons is the top group. And Carlos. Yes. Uh, so sorry. Eh? I, I think the the uh, sound is degrading a little bit. Uh, okay. It has been degraded in, in in when you were showing the the past slide. I was wondering if if you should, have, for example, quit the room and and enter again, and or I don't know if you have some noise source uh, around you. No, I that, don't. Uh, but uh, I can. Let me. Or maybe if you can. Uh, uh, um, stop the video uh, to see if the connection gets, if, if the bandwidth gets better. Okay, yes, can we start. can we try this? Yes, sure. So just a step on. I stop the video. 
mm -hmm. or uh, use a maybe use a headset. Okay. Yes. Try that. Okay. So give me a minute. I'll bring. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Good idea. Thank you. Sure. One minute. Okay, let me see. I am uh, also disconnecting from the wireless. I connected to the LAN Ethernet connection. That also would um, help. And I will try to connect the audio separately, if that would help. Let's see. I think that's getting much better. Okay, so let's try like that. Yeah, let, let's keep like this. Yeah, please. Very good. Okay. And thank you. Yes. Okay. I, I will try to move a bit uh, faster. So this is comparison of different signals. That's the main message. And the color is the energy. And um, maybe again, I repeat it. It's very important concept to understand that radiation has different components, different. So, sorry, Carlos. Sorry. Can, can you switch on your camera again? That, that will be very nice. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And thank you. Just a second, where is it? That's fine. Thank you. Yes. Um, so this is data collected with the same device in different radiation sources. So I just um, put them together, and you can we can see. Oh, this is another uh, set of. Oops, yes. So different particles, different energies, different directions. And the device, the detector is able to recognize that. This is very valuable, nearly unique feature for a small integrated device. Yes, normally to extract this information, the technology was much complicated, bigger devices, very specific, etc. So this is one of the big advantages of this technology, of these detectors. Um, and then here I show, on the other hand, signals, we call them clusters or isolated clusters, from the same particle. All these are proton tracks, proton signals of two energies, but that's not so relevant. But the difference is the direction. So, and they are labels there. So the small clusters, the small signals on top, they are signals made by protons perpendicular to the sensor. And then they begin, or this is data at bigger and bigger angles, so 45 degrees is like the middle, and then nearly perpendicular and nearly sorry, parallel is on the bottom. Yes, so this is also important especially for the analysis uh, of for the experts and uh, for the people uh, using these devices for to measure for nuclear physics or characterization of radiation, etc., to understand this. Yes, this work is being done. So these uh, response matrices, or if you like calibrations, 
are very necessary, certainly. Yes, the, the biggest value uh, or a very big value here or result is the capability to distinguish different uh, particles uh, in a, what is called unknown field or mixed radiation field. Okay, and then this is uh, data from uh, typical um, medical radiotherapy environments. On the left is signals from protons. On the middle is signals from carbon ions, which are used uh, for past years also as a tool to treat cancer. So this is hadron or ion beam radiotherapy. You can see in the middle how the detector allows to distinguish primary particles based on their energy deposited and also direction. So it's convolution is a combination of information, great, and then appear many uh, secondary particles characteristic of different energy, direction, etc. Yes, so this level of detail is very uh, unique and very valuable for uh, scientists and experts, and hopefully for students and the new generation. This is a development done, uh, started by the university here in Prague, where I was, in the Institute of the Czech Technical University. And this is the implementation of this technology into a satellite. This is a medium sized satellite, they call it micro satellites uh, class category. Uh, it's, um, it's about one meter size, I don't know, 150 kilograms, the whole satellite. And the device carrying the time peaks chip, which is shown in the middle, is shown uh, there uh, on the outer wall of the satellite. This is the rocket, etc. And this, the data to show you, I am showing you how uh, data or the signals of different radiation look like. So here you can see them. These are the snapshots or visualization of radiation in outer space in LEO orbit, low Earth orbit, 800 kilometers, so higher than the International Space Station. And these are just snapshots, just examples um, of the radiation field in different uh, locations, GPS locations along the satellite orbit. And these are some details. Yes. So this information is uh, very valuable, very interesting, because it allows to provide, to determine more, extract more information about the radiation field. The composition, the number, the intensity, which is called flux, and also the direction, yes, and the deposit of energy, et cetera. So there you see it. This is uh, also related for this lecture to inspire the students or show them what is available. So the university group, we prepare a web portal. This was the first uh, say, version of the portal, which was accessible and is accessible through the internet. So here you can choose and you can uh, find the correlated information between the detector response and the satellite position, orientation, that's also important, how it's oriented, et cetera. So the information is relatively complex. Uh, this web portal has been elaborated very nicely today, already for a few years. This is work by university students uh, uh, specialized in IT, so they are non-physics, non-nuclear physics students. And uh, it's accessible through the internet. I can click it or you have the link here. And uh, you can find the position and then you can uh, visualize, you can see how the radiation field looks like and it's uh, quite in part, uh, eva uh, evaluated. So you can see the, some fluxes and some um, classification of the composition of the radiation field. Yes, this is available. And if there will be time, we can always come back to this. To show to the students, um, this is still not the end of the story because the information is actually a chain, it's a process. So the results that I was showing you already process, evaluated, they can be analyzed further. For example, this way, this is a map a detailed long-term map of radiation along the satellite orbit measured by time peaks. This is data of a few weeks. Well, the time data is shown on bottom. These are called time distributions. Uh, so on the bottom, I think I'm showing data for one month. And the vertical axis is, um, which is in logarithmic scale. This means uh, exponential, so they are like five or six orders of magnitude. In this case, in the bottom is shown the dose rate, which is one of the basic uh, physics quantities, which is photosymmetry, to quantify the interaction of, uh, of radiation in matter. 
And on the top plots, I think I use longer data to make the plot more complete. And this is a detailed map of radiation alongside the satellite orbit in logarithmic scale, which is another feature uh, advantage of these uh, detectors that they are uh, operational in wide range. What it means, you see the exponential there, so it's six, seven orders of magnitude. It means that you one can measure, for example, if it were speed, speed of R, you can measure uh, five kilometer per hour, 50 kilometer per hour, 100 kilometer per hour, but also 1,000 and 1 million kilometer per hour, and even 10 million and even more. Yes, yeah, so this is um, very uh, wide, very uh, attractive, very valuable dynamic range. The device does not saturate. Yes, in this wide range. So it has ultimate sensitivity. It can detect single particles, as we show you, but it's also powerful. It's also uh, capable to measure very high fluxes or the um, values of deposited energy. This is structure here, there will be time. This is a, a, an anomaly. This is an asymmetry of the radiation belts around the Earth as compared to the uh, shape and the distribution of the geographic Earth map. And the rings on, on top and bottom, these are the, uh, the polar corners of the external uh, radiation belt, which is mostly electrons, etc. So we have some particular uh, distributions. We can come back to this. And here, what I show again for students or uh, for some colleagues, um, the uh, integrated doses, for example, per year, in the particular positions. So the color again shows the intensity, in this case, the whole state. So if the satellite were to stay, let's say, in one of these positions, so you could see the actually large dose that it would acquire, yes, during one year. So even on this level, so this is like three, four orders of magnitude higher than doses that, let's say, patients receive in radiotherapy treatments, yes. That's why radiation in space is important, is necessary to monitor, to characterize, to measure, and then to shield, etc. Yeah, so this is a, one of the main motivations of space agencies, uh, NASA and the European Space Agency, is to um, study, to uh, investigate, and to, and to develop or use radiation monitors, radiation detectors on board satellites. For students motivated in some applications, so here I just show some more, uh, let's say, detailed maps. What I'm showing here is that even these, let's say, um, uh, subjects or fields are very interesting by themselves, like a science application. They are very dynamic. So these distributions of radiation, if you see, if you compare these maps in the middle, they change. So these are maps in different weeks. I have them somehow here described. And this is what happens. This is how the radiation field in orbit near the Earth changes during geomagnetic storms and the related or consecutive um, uh, geo, geo storms uh, or um, distortions of the radiation field and the magnetosphere around the Earth. Yes. And the changes are very large. So you can see the colors again, the logarithmic. So in some places, the radiation changes by a thousand times or even more, the composition, the direction. Yes, and these things are, these tasks are subject of studies. Here I have some simple animations of what I'm trying to tell you that the distribution in this case of radiation in orbit is very dynamic process. So if you follow, it's very simple, just few seconds you might be able to see how the radiation field changes. And this is in periods of weeks. Yes, this is data already from. So you might see that during a period of geomagnetic storm, the, the radiation field changes. This was the view from the South Pole. This is the view from the North Pole, you can see. So again, you might be able to see how the, the color, the distribution, etc. And then there is the region of the South Atlantic anomaly I was telling you. And you may also see how it fluctuates, how it moves, and more details maps can be done. I show this also because in part for me and for some people who are working on this, this reminds, resembles the concept of climate, of uh, weather. And the subject in space is actually called space weather, yes, which has to do with the interaction and the 
um, the presence of, uh, of radiation in, in outer space, the dynamics, the composition, etc. Yes. Okay, moving forward, this is to show you one of the implementations of this technology again for in this case, small satellites. You may have heard many of you. These are CubeSats, which are uh, cheaper, faster, simpler to build. So the first Czech, uh, Czech Cube uh, satellite, after uh, 15 or so years, it was a CubeSat, and the detector was uh, there as a key part of the main uh, payload, which was which is a science instrument. It's a X-ray optics telescope to provide, to, to make um, detailed X-ray images of stellar objects, starting with the sun or some nearby stars. They are sources of X-rays. So the detector allows to combine with X-ray optics, which is the main payload here, allows to uh, uh, measure and, uh, and collect um, X-ray images of in, in, in orbit. These are typical data from the detector on board these uh, satellites. You already can see the different specific tracks. So immediately, if you remember what we saw, these larger round tracks, they are heavy particles, protons of a certain energy range. And these smaller tracks, they are X-rays and electrons in general. And then these uh, elongated tracks are energetic penetrating particles. So immediately we can see just by visual inspection without further analysis, let's say three uh, main components which can be further analyzed. Uh, again, from the CubeSat uh, Cubes uh, data, these radiation maps can be generated in limited, let's say, resolution and range, etc. And on the left, you have a typical frame uh, correlated with the position. This data is also available from the Czech CubeSat. Uh, I leave here the link. You can just open it, but there's no time for that. So this is part of the link. And they are open and, and data can be um, um, downloaded or you can uh, even interact with the uh, so select some data ranges. Um, this, let me, because it's for students, I would like to, in a few minutes, and try to tell them very short introduction or explain them um, about the core technology of the detectors and how they are, how they compare, how they are, um, let's say, described, compared with other technologies, very brief. So the core, the critical, the key part, the component is this uh, highly advanced um, AC uh, chip, which is uh, described or shown here. Um, and this is a development, long-term development by, uh, by many uh, European, mostly European institutes over the years. This is illustrations of, the, of this um, uh, detector uh, chip or AC chip uh, technology it has some heat hybrid uh, architecture, means that on top there is the radiation sensitive part and then the highly integrated electronics. So, this architecture is what allows this level of sensitivity, dynamic range, and features to be, to be, to be possible. You know? um, for the students, this is just one slide I prepared. This is a over the overview um, classification or description of radiation detectors. They can be characterized according to the technology or to the type of detector. This is the column on the left, then according to their properties, and then according to the functions. Some of them are similar, but the concepts are uh, distinct. Yes, so for example, the properties, if you if the device detects radiation, if it, if it gives you this minimal information that there is some radiation, then if it has the capability to measure the energy in terms of deposited energy or the total energy of the particle, you see there are many details. Then if it uh, registers the position, not all detectors are position sensitive. Then if it's sensitive to time, then if it has some discrimination with particle types or other parameters, etc. Yes. So this, we don't have to go into uh, many details, but what I want to show here is that these uh, uh, time peaks, many peaks uh, detectors have uh, many advantages and many properties that allows them to provide a lot of the functions, a lot of the methods that um, uh, are um, can be exploited or are very valuable to measure, characterize radiation even to make images. So this is the radiographies. We can also show you one, one image. 
but the light has functions. So in terms of radiation, one can have a detector is just like an alarm, but there is some radiation. This is the very basic in terms similar like to counting to say there is a lot of radiation, there is little radiation. Something in spectrometry about energy, dosimetry, which is um, properly evaluated uh, spectral information, imaging, if it can function, if it can uh, visualize the radiation or make give information on the distribution of the radiation on the detector or or, or on the from the source. This is uh, uh, specific, and then also timing. And then I added a few more regarding tracking, direction, visualization of radiation. So there are more, more functions, yes. And one concept also in terms of processing of data. I think I already mentioned you at the beginning. Um, the detector itself is great, provides excellent data, but this has to be processed. This is actually a chain, a, a set, a sequence of steps. So I have something like four wide groups. So the raw data is acquired, and then it should be pre-processed, it should be analyzed, starting with the calibration, which is somewhere in the middle, the recognition of tracks, which pixels belong to the same particle, and then the processing itself. There are many steps here, we can come back to this, and then some, I would call it, or we call it here with my student post-processing, yes, where uh, finally some physics results proper appear. Yeah, so you need to have a, a proper calibration to follow the units, to have some uh, quantities, and to um, analyze and evaluate properly the data. Yes, and um, and then um, so that's that allows you to. Well, that's what makes these devices attractive and applicable in many fields of research. So I have identified um, sixteen distinct fields. So for students who, for example, would like to work or will use some someday accelerators or some, uh, I don't know, some measurement in orbit in space or work in some uh, medical imaging application, etc. So um, this technology uh, provides, uh, it's useful and provides uh, many advantages. So trying to characterize or to uh, make some groups of these many applications I, on the left, I put these broader categories like space. Actually, I see there like three uh, directions, medical, material science, uh, um, applied research, and also education, actually, which is this, this, uh, actually, this seminar today. And if one then uh, tries to link or characterize, so for example, the space, they are here. These medical applications, there are many. This is maybe the biggest group. Uh, in terms of uh, radiation imaging or also radiotherapy uh, application uh, related, um, digital science, etc. No, we can come back here. The great ones, these are um, nuclear physics. This is what I call science. So people studying cosmic rays or doing uh, nuclear reaction experiments, a particle accelerator or with a nuclear reactor, etc. Yes. Uh, to show you one of these examples for, uh, of, of radiographies. So this is the radiography of a, a simple, of a basic sample. So it's, it's, there's, it's a sequence of several foils. And uh, it's possible, and this is work I do with a student who is a non-physics student, and he works at an accelerator here in Prague. So he is producing uh, radiographies with protons using different, I call it contrast, uh, contrast parameters. So just counting the events, is the figure on the top uh, middle, uh, based on the energy differences in the deposited energy, you can create, a, you can produce a contrast uh, radiography on the right, top right, on the size of the, of the uh, clusters of the signals already carries information about that, and also on the on some further parameters of the data. And this is this is valuable. It allows to enhance, improve the sensitivity in this case of radiographies. This is the purpose of this work. Yes, and um, and, uh, and derive uh, more precise information in this case of the sample. This is another uh, example of applications. This I call these maps, which I make myself uh, directional maps of energetic radiation. Um, on the right, let me start there. This is the directional map of uh, energetic secondary cosmic rays in the atmosphere. This is in, here in the public in a hill. This is data for about a week. And using um, 
stack, uh, high angular resolution device, which is on the top right, uh, provides high angular resolution. So one can, pro one can make these very detailed uh, wide range maps or distributions, directional distributions of radiation, uh, which is very useful. And in the middle actually is the application. So this is the distribution of radiation in the radiotherapy treatment measurement. There is the primary beam, there's an illustration I draw on top left, and, and there is, let's say, a thin target, which was actually a foil, and then a water phantom, which simulates the patient, and the distribution and the origin of energetic particles can be mapped with a single stack timepiece device at a distance, yes, in wide field of view. So there are always some, I call it engineering uh, parameters, which are um, sometimes limiting for other technologies. Uh, and in this case, they are advantageous. So it allows to scan the directional distribution of particles in wide field of view, yes, without using collimators, et cetera. So this information can be produced uh, relatively quickly and in such level of detail. And in color, the information here shown is the number of particles. Well, this is over show, but uh, this was in some four or five orders of magnitude. Yeah, so it's very selective. Yes. And this is uh, the last part of my uh, seminar. This is the deployment in orbit, work initiated and done uh, still today by the Prague University Group, the ERCTU. So this was the first uh, deployment in orbit of this technology of the timepiece uh, devices um, in uh, work done and in cooperation with, with NASA, um, CERN, and the Prague uh, University Institute. And here you see these are official photos of the ISS. This is this cupola, which was also provided by Europe. And here you see one of the astronauts' uh, laptops on the left, and it's, to it is attached one of these uh, miniaturized timepiece devices. Yes, and you see it on top right how it is. So these are official photos from the ISS, and the data is, uh, is what I was uh, showing. This is the um, uh, recent developments in, in the International Space Station. So these are a collection of, uh, this is one of the sets of devices delivered by Advacam to NASA, and they are accommodated in different places on various modules of uh, NASA on board on the, on the ISS. And on the bottom left, you can see a typical photo. Yes, so these are windows and the devices are there, and they collect data permanently. So they are measuring and characterizing the, they call it space radiation and um, wide range and um, for, for, for NASA. And this is an illustration of the motivation by the space agencies, in particular ESA, the European Space Agency. From the sun, from the galaxy, um, from the Earth radiation belts, you might see the illustration there, there is a lot of radiation. And this needs, as I was mentioning, to be measured, monitored, characterized on board satellites protect sensitive devices, even solar panels, antennas, memories, yes. So this is actually a critical task, a big motivation by these um, institutes or by this uh, uh, industry sector. This is illustration of how energetic radiation are in space and how they should be characterized. And there is at present, this is the last part I will show here, so just last minutes. There is already approved and is being already developed a new um, the space station, it's called Gateway, it will orbit around the moon, so it will still take some years. This is led by NASA in cooperation with three other space, uh, space agencies, uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. And they will be assembling together a not so small all new space station, which will be orbiting the moon. I have an illustration later. And the devices, the time peaks, uh, medipix CERN technology has been already uh, pre-selected and is approved for uh, implementation into this future, uh, it's called lunar, lunar Orbit Space Station Gateway. So in particular, there are two developments uh, which I am directly involved. One is together with the university group and the other one is uh, directly with the integrators. These are uh, this one group from Belgium, one group from Hungary. And the devices will be implemented on two uh, separate NASA modules of this uh, lunar orbit uh, space station. The illustration is here on the right. Uh, it's not in scale, 
If you see the mouse and the moon is on one end, the orbit will be highly eccentric. The uh, highest distance, it will be 70,000 kilometers. So it's just crazy distance. To compare the ISS, the International Space Station, is only 400, not even that, above the Earth. So it's 400 kilometers. This one will be orbiting the moon, so it's much farther from the Earth, which I also try to show here. And the nearest approach to the moon is uh, 3,000 kilometers, and the whole orbit will be one week. That's what we'll be doing. So it's, it's a very specific, very ambitious uh, program and orbit for this, um, this lunar lunar uh, space space station. And uh, in frame of these uh, developments, in, in activity directly with uh, NASA, there will be a, there is a third um, a development related to this program. It's called actually the broader program is called Artemis by NASA. Uh, one of which uh, will have a called the lunar moon lander, and the technology this um, this um, mini uh, Tempest three devices have been also pre selected for implementation here on um, on a on a NASA moon lander. Yes. Okay. So I think my time is up. Maybe we can. If there are more questions, we can we can continue. I have a couple of slides also of some non-space applications, but maybe I can start here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlo. I think it, your presentation contained uh, lots of resources that will be very valuable for the for the audience. So you mentioned visualization, and I think that's one of the key uh, of the of this device to provide valuable data to the to the prof to the teachers. And I think it is uh, quite cool that the, the same technology that uh, are using astronauts or are, is used in, in satellites is also or can also be used at the schools to monitor radiation and to, to teach the, the kids uh, something that is quite abstract, no? that is visualization of, of particles and particle physics. So thank you very much. And uh, the floor is open for, for questions. Okay, until we get questions, I just give me one, two minutes. I just mention what is still here because for, for people just to know, this is just two more slides. Mm -hmm. This one, they call it in, in ESA, in the European Space Station uh, Agency, they call it um, spin off developments of the technology. And this was initiated actually by the cooperation and the application of uh, with ESA. And this is a technique, actually a small company was founded already, which is living on itself. And they introduced a highly sensitive technique to detect and inspect art paintings, valuable. So from uh, the impressionists and from these um, uh, prestigious museums to detect uh, fakes, forgeries. Yes, and so it's combining advanced information from uh, the uh, art um, restorers, people specialize and um, ex experience in, in, in knowledge of uh, painter, uh, painters and painting styles and so on, together with us. So the, the, the detectors enable to extract characteristic information, combine imaging and analysis information from the paintings non-destructively, and then this is correlated, in part also calibrated by a specific painter and painting style. So even not just the material, but also the structure, the depth, and there is a lot of information there. Then this is analyzed, and then is compared with unknown or with uh, forgery uh, paintings, etc. So this is really interesting uh, development. And the last thing I show you, because there was interest by the students, I understood. So this is a new activity I have. I am developing for ISA. This is a web portal tool for data processing in wide range. Yes, and it has a website. I can click it, or you can see it there. We have a basic uh, experimental uh, version there. So it allows people collecting data, including students with the mini pics, edu, etc. You can just upload it, and then the web portal, we call it engine, because it's a whole system with the response matrices, calibrations, etc., will process you the data to a pretty high level. So this is just a snapshot of the web uh, of the web portal. You can see the time evolution of the flux 
the number of particles per square centimeter and all the dose rate. And this is some measurement. This is my data, I think. This is some measurement. I don't remember. It's somewhere described that. So you can always upload your data and literally, basically, automatically, the web portal, the engine, a process for you the data. You have to describe, you have to enter what was the sensor thickness on parameters, etc. But this huge work, which is actually my long-term activity, it's been automatized to a high level in this tool. Yes, and this is also available. Or is becoming available. So you have here some sets. So you see on the left we show some testing data, you no know, X-rays, proton data, electron from accelerator, alphas, etc. I still haven't tested mixed field. Yeah, so this is actually, it's not so simple, basically. And this work I do together with my student, with, he's a PhD student, the one who made the, the video also. Yeah, so this is a work which uh, is um, um, attractive, valuable for, for young people. Yes, I have another student, bachelor student, also from the university. So if, if people are interested, uh, they can contact us directly or uh, Rafael Balabrica or the, the team in CERN or the Prague University. Yes, or just let me know and I pass you the contact, etc. Yes, or this uh, things directly with us is also, also possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any comments or questions? If you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand introduce yourself and ask your question. Yeah, Danny? Uh, hello, I'm Danny Patricias. I have a couple, a couple of questions, uh, but first of all, I want to, to thank you for this amazing presentation. I, I have uh, uh, I have found lots of resources I'm, I'm going to use, certainly, because uh, are very interesting and, and amazing. Uh, my, my first question is, is about the difference between the, the standard Minipix device and the Minipix Edu. One of my main concerns about the, 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 the standard Minipix is, is the uh, their fragility and and I know that Rafael is, is concerned by, by by the same problem and and I know I want to know what's the, the difference between Minipix Edu and the standard device in sensibility and sturdiness. Um, yes, I'm sorry. I can. Where is my presentation? Um, you still see my screen? Yes, 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 I can see. Yes. So part of the answer, I'll try to show it here. But, um, so one thing is the ASIC, MediPix, TimePix, ASIC type. Mm -hmm. are, um, few. And so in particular is the TimePix. And then um, there, there are new versions which are still uh, being, let's say, implemented. So there are the TimePix 3, for example, and this is, uh, this is one, let's say, one difference with um, other MediPix TimePix devices. The other difference, maybe bigger also, is the electronics. Yes, so for example, these bigger devices, uh, if you see my mouse on bottom, yes, it's, it's that one is, it. is bigger, it has um, bigger size, mass, but also power consumption, but it provides more data. And also in high resolution, the TimePix chip is operated, let's say, in full performance, if you like, with these bigger electronics. The miniaturized ones, they are very good for many applications, let's say on drones. On drones is also, I didn't even mention it, but we are also working with that, on that with a university group. So it's miniaturized. The priority there is to keep it small, low power, etc. And the, the, the quality of the data is very high. It's quite, it's quite good for many applications. And then there are also small differences, let's say also in the quality of the chip, some of them, but these are really minor differences. So let's say it's, uh, the quality, sometimes you have few noisy pixels in the borders. So, which doesn't matter, not to me, I always measure with such devices. 
So these are, let's say, these, these minor differences. Then maybe also in the software, for these general purpose or applications, we also simplify the software um, to make it uh, simpler, easy to operate. So these are, these are, these are the, main, the main differences, no? To, to make the device um, as simple as possible. So the mini pixel Edu, I show it here bottom right, is the ideal one. It also in cost, this also was motivated to uh, drive the cost as low as possible. So it's the, the cheapest or is the less, this expensive device possible. Mm -hmm. So Perfect. I have noticed that uh, there is no this, this, uh, this cover, this, uh, oh. Sure. Uh, Raphael usually always yes. says, don't touch the sensor, okay. this yes. to the students, and uh, what's the reason uh, to... to... Yeah, myself, I don't know, I think was to keep it simple. I understand that it's, it should be a little bit resistance. Of course, it's not recommended. It should not be, it should not be dropped anything on the sensor. The other one, the one we call it mini peaks in the in the company. It this has this cover. That's really very practical. Mm -hmm. What they have in here. No, no, it's, it's amazing. You're right. It's an amazing device. And yes, and I can show you. If you still, yes, if you still see my screen. Yes, this is the device that my student Lucas was working with. So this is the uh, mini peaks Edu. So he himself uh -huh. created this cover, which he. Mm -hmm puts in and puts out because it makes it useful. So okay. you can make more and just add it to it, no? Because it's very practical. Mm -hmm. Keep it safe, you see? I can see it, okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Carlos. Sure. And the other device is the one you you know, is um, it has this cover. You, you are right, and this one is much mm -hmm. more, what is this thing? This one is much more practical, yes. Okay, I can see the difference. Sure, but um, I don't know. I would, I, I prefer it with the cover. It's certainly much better. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will find out, <laughs> we'll let you know. Okay. Yeah, I, I have to say that the students in, uh, in Danny's school have been using the, the chip since uh, 2017. And, uh, and uh, I'm very, very glad to say that there was no accident. So they, mm -hmm. they have been uh, really, really careful dealing with it. And uh, I'm very happy for that. And yeah. Is there any other question? Yes, uh, my name is, is David Currons. I am teacher. Yes, do, do you listen to me? Yes. Yes, we um, can hear you. Okay, and I am. I have. Uh, uh, I I have three, three students here listening to you, and I'm very proud. Uh, so I thank you very much because uh, the problem of physics uh, in high school is that uh, um, uh, to understand something, uh, you have to to practice this. So. Nuclear physics and radioactive physics and ra radiation, so it's difficult to to learn. And here in Catalonia, uh, we we have a, a very special thing. Uh, we I don't know if in your country, Carlos, uh, you do uh, your students, your high school students, they they have a, a research project. So it's very interesting because with this uh, research project we can uh, focalize. Uh, something interesting to study. So I am very happy to, to, to find with you a lot of uh, different fields to, to learn. For example, uh, some, some of my students want to study the, for example, the nuclear fusion. So the central nuclear fusion. So, but, but it is difficult to, to learn uh, and to practice. So, uh, do, you can uh, study some theoretic, theoretical things, no? But uh, what I would like to, to ask you is that uh, teachers, uh, we need uh, some formation, some webinars to, to learn more about this um, 
a specific uh, mini peaks and uh, white peaks camera. So, uh, is it possible to 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 learn more about the, this uh, this uh, all, all this knowledge? Yes. Yes, it is. It's just a problem with time, but certainly, and I enjoy it, and I am just happy to help. I am always assisting people. Maybe Rafael knows. Um, sure, you can contact uh, me directly, or we can maybe with Rafa try to organize something similar, let's say in one month or within really some time after you go through the material, because you will see the links. Yes, and uh, we can organize, I propose, or any other idea is just as good. The data is available for, 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 for most things, you know? So I have a big database of data, which allows me to evaluate all this, so, which is very good. So if you have students, or if you are interested on accelerator data, or also from the satellite, from um, the, the ProvaV is uh, best with the, directly with the Institute, but I can give you the contact. Also the Czech CubeSats, or uh, students or even teachers interested in some of these future developments, they take time, but uh, even if you are interested there, we could discuss how to make it accessible to you. Um, yes, or anything or many things could be considered or discussed. Uh, I have also data or some ideas also, sim simpler ideas for students like this type of work. So if you want to devote some time or have uh, some students, clever students motivated mm -hmm. with uh, programming or physics, etc., it's, it's possible to help pass them data or guide them. Yes, anything. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I have to say that uh, David Curron's uh, he, student uh, last year, he did a research uh, project, very nice, in which he was comparing uh, data he took with time peaks at sea level with uh, data that uh, that he analyzed from the International Space Station and uh, as well through some colleagues in uh, in the Czech Technical University he could also access some of this data from the uh, Prova satellite and then he could uh, make the uh, the study of comparing radiation the radiation field at different uh, depths so it, it was very nice uh, piece of work by one of these uh, um, students uh, from David in the framework of this uh, research uh, project, Trabal de Recerca. Thanks to Rafael because he, he was behind me. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you one, one question, uh, Carlos. Uh, I, together with Michael Campbell, uh, who is also present here, uh, we were in a, in a meeting a couple of weeks ago where Stanislav Pospisil, he, he mentioned that there was a program already going on in the Czech Republic with uh, some schools uh, using these uh, detectors. C can, you, can you comment about what is the, uh, the scheme that you use to, uh, so that the schools have access to these devices? For example, in the in this Admira initiative, we have the support from uh, from the University of Barcelona, who is dealing with the logistics and as well with the uh, website. And I wanted to 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 uh, to ask you if you could uh, share some uh, so, some um, some ideas about how you organize that in Czech Republic. Yes, I know that activity is directly by the institutes, by Stanislav Institute. Um, just, yes, so I can check, actually, I am not familiar with the latest news. I know, um, I can tell you two things. <clears throat> the first big activity that was many years ago was, the, it was called CHELTA. It was a network of cosmic ray stations, large detectors. Uh, conventional for cosmic rays. And based on that, they started extending it with uh, time peaks, pixel detectors. Um, it was quite nice. Uh, so many high schools were involved, also in Slovakia and Romania and some neighboring countries. Uh, so, and they have a website we used to have, so I can check that. And I think this recent activity was based or came out from that. 
And there is one, it's called Vijana, his name, he's a colleague of Stanislav, he's a physics uh, high school teacher here in Czech Republic, and he is uh, active in that. I am not uh, familiar with the details, but they are working on that to try to make, I understood, I remember, to, to make it uh, broadly accessible to more schools because it has some price and also the training of the teachers is not so obvious, no? So it's a, a question of resources of the people training them. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, uh, well, I try to support it, uh, but uh, I don't know details. I can, I can check. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you. Is there any other question? Maybe I can comment. This time pick said we should help because that was one of the, let's say, limiting factors. So the time pick said with the price, this is really manufacturing price. The licenses are also minimal. So really everything went down. The production of the device, of course, costs something. So it cannot be for free, of course. So it's really the lowest, uh, the lowest possible price. Also, the production should be relatively fast. So it's optimized to make it accessible to a wider market or users, and namely students, and also the software, the, the physics. When you check the website, which I put, so there is this. Let me let me find it. I just show you because it's nice. Mm -hmm. it's, um, because it's part of the world. So it's not just the camera. It's not just the detector. So when you when you go come here, yeah, these are the websites. Yes. So here, what I show you the uh, mini pics edu. So this company implemented um, all the material. We pass it to them. We assist in them. So when you click on that, let me just show you. You will see how, how interesting it is. They have a nice website. So everything is accessible through the internet, and and it's described. So the kit, the detector, and you see here, so this is also a very important part. So the description of the setup, the material, you know, the sources, and uh, this, I actually took it from them, yes. And the know-how they have from us, also from the Institute, yes. So when you click there, you see, and then there are these uh, um, exercises, yes, they are. <laughs> So all these, there are few concepts or physics, let's say, measurements, demonstrations, and they are justified, they are introduced, they are explained. This is nice work, and this is valuable. Yes, this should help the students and the teachers prepare and use, uh, exploit, make most use of the um, kit of the device, even the cosmic ray things. And, range of uh, photons, etc. You see, black holes. So even these concepts you can introduce relatively quickly to high school teachers and high school students. And when you click there, even the spectrum, you see, I just gave up because there is no time. <laughs> we can do this there, let's say, next time. Yes, but this, uh, here you have uh, explanations, part of the software also to produce it. I, I know, Rafael, you wanted me, but it was just too much, you see, and we are short on time. So these concepts, and which are not so, let's say, simple at first, they can be quickly introduced and uh, described, and the students can uh, understand that, which is fantastic, it's beautiful. So it's part of the software, the methodology is explained very simply, so it's, it's, it's great material. You see some comments for the teachers, so this is well, well elaborated. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for these uh, resources that I'm sure they, they will be very valuable for, for many of the people in the audience. Yes. I see Michael has a question. Oh, it's not a question, it's just a comment. Uh -huh. Thank you, Carlos and Advocam really a lot for all the effort which went into developing these things. Um, and also the, the team in Barcelona, Rafa and Daniel and, and others. I think from the perspective of CERN and from the collaboration, we are really supportive of this thing. One of the challenges is that the technology is still a bit expensive for schools. So we are starting to work on ideas of how to make it more accessible, let's say, to schools in different countries. So bear with us. <laughs> it might take some time to get to find the right uh, model, but we really would like to see this material becoming available for, for students. And 
what we've seen today is that there are the, the kind of question which David proposed asked earlier about how about how, how do the teachers learn how to use it? These are the kind of things we have to to put into place in each country, so that the um, so that the, the physics teacher can plug this thing in and then and then show it to the the, the, the pupils. So thanks a lot. That was my uh, main point. Yes. If I can have a short comment, uh, thank you uh, for that. Yes, we appreciate it and it's, it's really valuable, the cooperation and all the work, all the heritage of, by CERN and by the Prague Institute and cooperating groups. Yes, this is, this is clear. And, and it's very valuable. So there is a lot of knowledge, a lot of know-how. Then second very short comment, uh, because I know the price, etc. Maybe you see on, on the video, these, these are some panels you see here we have, you might see in my screen or in my video. And these are the, for me, it's standard, no? that's the standard Time Peaks or Time Peaks 3 radiation camera. And that's uh, much faster, it's high performance because I'm a scientist, so I, I need the best data as possible, etc. And that is uh, much more expensive, it's, I don't know, Ten times more expensive uh, than the price of the of this uh, mini pix edu. So that's already a big um, big uh, benefit or a big uh, result, no? Yeah. Big progress in that direction. Yeah. So my, sorry, Carlos, I, I wasn't intending to criticize the price. I think you're basically charging the cost, mm -hmm. and it's difficult to get the cost lower. What I'm saying is that we may be we are looking for ways of bringing in financial help yes. to, uh, to reduce the price. Sure, maybe some funding projects, in, even in Czech Republic or in Europe, also the group in UK, you, you know them. So there was sometimes uh, the initiative or the idea to try to get some subsidy or some, some uh, let's say, aid. Yes, and one thing that has to say, this is what I wanted to say, Michael, that the technology is really top. This is um, I can literally say this is the best detector technology in the world ever in terms of taking into account all the parameters, the miniaturization, the sensitivity, the power consumption, no need of collimators, room temperature devices, yes, to extract and obtain uh, this uh, beautiful data, high quality data in range sensitivity or resolution. So it's literally uh, sophisticated, state-of-the-art technology. And this has to be said to the public, to the students. Yes, that this is why NASA adopted the technology as a certified NASA detect radiation detector technology themselves. And they certified it, they did the dosimetry, etc. themselves. This is amazing, it's fantastic. ISA similar. ISA decided, recognized, understood that this is key technology it, it has uh, many advantages, and it's even part of the agreement, cooperation agreement between CERN and ESA, the European Space uh, um, Agency. They have like 10 subjects of activity, and this is one of them, so it's fantastic. So just to remind, to remind the students, the public, that they are getting a, a really exceptional technology with fantastic features which allows them, the students, us, me, to, to make a, a very nice work, very valuable. So it's, it's really the best technology ever, you know? So to have it accessible to the students, the same device that is on a satellite, that is going to fly to the moon, and that the, the, same, the same chip, the, the students, the teachers can buy or can use, it's, it's fantastic. So thank you, uh, Michael. <laughs> thank you, CERN the Peaks collaboration. <laughs> a, a, a lot of people contributed to that. Just not yes. only us. <laughs> and maybe I can commend you. Uh, last week, because this is true, uh, <clears throat> Czech Republic is now finished the second CubeSat, and the detector is also there. Yes, and there are other. There is also another technology also from Czech Republic and so. On. But these are these APDs, the amorphous pixel detectors. And they also show and so, and they have some advantages, power consumption, etc. But the quality of the data, and I, am, I belong to those that understand, that makes a difference. So you can have other devices that also make some tracks and so, and it's like similar. But the real data, when you properly process it, or when, you, when, the, when the user proper, uh, processes 
analysis in terms of dosimetry, yes, this spectral tracking technique, etc. Then you see the big difference and the range that the detector does not saturate, that we can measure fluxes up to the, I don't know, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. With Jan Jakube, we have a new technique also with the Pospisil to extract information on pileup events. My phone is very nice. Yes, this was also done for ISA. So even when the fluxes are too high, we can still extract information on the fluxes and on the dose rates. Okay, so this is really unique features uh, that no other um, detector technology can provide. So it's, um, it's, it's really fantastic um, yeah, te technology and capabilities that can be made available for, for the broader public, no? for the students and so on. Yes. Thank you. For uh, ongoing, also you saw in the evaluation, so the, um, the application, there is a big potential for applications, so even in space for spin-off companies, for example, the drones. Yes, so uh, we have a project also um, here with the university, and that's fantastic. The devices using the high set sensors, the climbing chloride for this direction and camera detection, it's really interesting with limited angular resolution, but allows to uh, um, localize uh, radiation sources in wide field of view without collimators and with a miniaturized device. So this can be also attractive for students and the physics teachers, no? because you can put it on a drone and this should become also available. Yes, so, so this is also another, another interesting line of, of development. They are combining, maybe for another lecture, or maybe I can arrange it, and they combine vision, so there is an optical camera, and there is the, the time peak, time peak 3, and then um, this, uh, this combined information, directional gamma detection, and the optical camera, they are merged, they are synchronized, even if the thing moves, and then you identify, and then you know, from the detector, there is a radiation source coming from some direction, and the camera synchronized tells you you see you see the combined information. And there are some first results, so this is also a very nice work. Thank you very much, Carlos. Mm -hmm. Is there any other questions? Yeah, Danny, you want to make a comment? You're, you're muted. Now? Yeah. OK, sorry. Uh, I haven't, uh, Carlos, I have uh, understood you said something about the importance of calibration in measuring high energy particles. Last year, we tried to measure energy of cosmic uh, moons using better block formula, and uh, it didn't work. And now I'm wondering if there are, if there were any configuration issue with the with the detector, uh, could you provide any advice in order to um, improve these measurements, this kind of measurements of high energy particles? Okay, so maybe one quick reply. Uh, let's say the. Um, is uh, in terms of uh, what we call degrees of freedom. So type of particle, this is the first main parameter. And so in this case, once they are charged particles, but they are light and, uh, and um, lower than an electron, of course, and they are highly penetrating and they are highly energetic. In terms of interaction of radiation in matter, particular charged particles, they behave as MIPS, minimum ionizing particles, the sensitivity of the detectors allow to detect them, which is also another um, unique, unique or fantastic feature, because they they are particles that deposited deposit really very little energy. So many other detectors don't even see them. Yes, and they don't they cannot even detect them or measure them or do some tracking. We can with the with the time peaks pixel detectors. Yes, um, calibration. Well. Mm, uh, in, in my work, I, I try to, and I have something like eight classes of particles in broad field of view, 
broad particle type and broad spectrum. These are these three concepts. And these energetic um, muons, secondary muons, I just put them together with energetic electrons, etc. Yes, I have actually two classes depending on the direction, because when they are under large angle, then one can separate them better. When they are perpendicular, the tracks are very small, one cannot separate them with other overlaps, even with x rays or so, depending on the direction. This is one thing. Calculation. So, as far as I know, moons in general, because they are short lived particles, even for an accelerator, they are like microseconds and so on. So, they are highly, highly relativistic, highly energetic. So, they behave uh, as minimum ionizing particles. Um, so, when they are uh, incident on the detector on a large angle, then you could separate them, let's say, from others closest, let's say, highly energetic electrons. So that's distinguished that that separation can be done. Another technique is to put two uh, time peaks detectors next to each other, as I showed, this is a telescope architecture. And then with coincidence, then you, and you have the small tracks that helps enhance the discrimination and improves also the angular resolution. So otherwise I wouldn't, so the calibration in terms of what? So the separation, the recognition of the events, and then the proper um, evaluation of the deposited energy. This will be the main two concepts. And may, the third one also the direction, you see? So particle type, energy deposited, and direction. Yes. So if I understood your question, maybe let me comment one more thing, if, if I can. Uh, there is uh, also, they are regarding the processing of the particles. And this was a suggestion by ISA in my case. Uh, in, in the project I have with them, they suggested me to, or us, to uh, try also artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques, which I know very little. And they have actually <laughs> explained to me. So we put this in together, and now we are working on that, and that looks very promising. There has been already some efforts in frame of the Medipix collaboration already a few years ago by the Prague group, I think also the NASA group in, in USA, uh, very nice, very promising work. What I mentioned is that that is a tool which should also help further analyze and expand and improve the resolution, the resolving power, the dynamic range, etc. of overall of the task of um, uh, separating particle types, of um, uh, improving, enhancing the resolving power, etc. So this is also ongoing work. We are working um, a lot on that, actually, with a group from USA, a group from Krakow. They are cooperating groups. And so this maybe could also, the idea there is that it should, as I say, uh, extend and complement this, uh, what I would call empirical techniques, empirical approaches, you know? Yeah, it's very interesting, and I'm glad uh, that you comment about uh, artificial intelligence because I have a student with this uh, research project, uh, and his goal is to train an artificial intelligence to identify the different tracks, the different particles uh, from from their tracks. So it's I'm glad you you comment this. You are working on that. I suppose that in a uh, Highly level and uh, with with a um, huge amount of data to improve all the measurement uh, process, as you say. Exactly. Yes, and this is um, so. If you have students working on that, if you would like to use some data or, or join, because the group they say they are experts on that, they are experienced on radiation. But then these detectors were completely new. We spent some effort and time explaining to them, but now they are progressing and it looks very interesting. So already a couple of groups. So there have been, as I say, a couple of teams uh, already tried that, but this systematic wide range effort was missing. So we are uh, working on that. And uh, if there are students or yourself, whatever, so it um, should be possible or would be interesting to explore cooperation or some, some. Uh, any advice uh, and help uh, yes. would be would be welcome. <laughs> Many thanks, Carlos. Yes, one comment, but this is without getting into details. The, the even the depth of the analysis. One approach I can commend you 
<laughs> is to analyze this, the individual tracks. This is one direction. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's my, my approach, uh, to take a single track and analyze it. This is one. The other one is to take the whole radiation field. So the detector collects a lot of data you saw in what I show you, and you are mm -hmm. the detectors. So you see that there is always some background radiation, some broken tracks, some pileups, etc. So there is also information in that. And the idea there in this, I call it more macroscopic approach, how to name it, it's to recognize the radiation source. So not just a single particle, but the radiation field itself, of course, influence modified by some shielding and by some, I don't know, directional uh, efficiency, etc. So it's a little bit complex. But and the artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques should be very powerful, efficient for, for this task. So actually we are um, making a hybrid. We are combining them. So they are helping each other. So this detailed empirical approach that I make, then we feed some of these parameters into artificial intelligence and it like helps further and it's just becoming to for me, for myself, so I can just hardly follow. But there is a, a big potential. So in my opinion, I see it, the instrumentation is very advanced, it's very mature, and this data processing and physics evaluation, these are bigger elements that come after, and there is big potential of work there, so for student thesis, for applications, to improve and enhance the technology, etc. is big room, yes? And it's also like a bed. Yeah, it, sounds, it sounds very interesting. Thank you very yes. much. Yes, and students, uh, students experience in programming. No, so I have, uh, I could say, half of my students they are non physics. They are programmers and they are uh, mechanical engineers. The one in the accelerator. Actually, I have two. <laughs> the two papers, <laughs> the two students, they work with me because they want to exploit new techniques. As I show you, these radiographies. Mm -hmm. That's like very interesting. No, this is made available by the by the detectors. So there is big big room for potential and work in, in the applications and in the data processing, in the, even in the high level data processing. Yes. Another direction. Let me comment you quickly. Is uh, this is driven by the space agency, especially ESA, uh, what I call onboard processing, also for the drones, because the detectors they produce a lot of data, as you may have seen. And depending on the <clears throat> on the read of electronics, the high performance, the expensive one, can produce a fraction of a giga, gigabyte per second. It's just wow. a lot of radiation, no? So it's just crazy, it's too much. And with ESA, the thing is, the request is that there is a big difference if the detector is on a satellite nearby uh, orbiting the Earth, or if it will be on a big orbit, like the telecommunication satellites. This is this was uh, this is geo orbit, so it's. Uh, almost 40,000 kilometers, or some of these deep space missions. So they have a big request to process the data on the device or on board. So, and this requires a lot of expertise and a lot of work on the side of uh, pro programmers, uh, close with the physics, of course. Yes, so we understand, uh, or I understand the physics, but uh, so there is a lot of work to do on the level of processing. To is these algorithms because on the computer we can have very, very um, uh, beautiful, you know, algorithms for pattern recognition, for uh, resolving power, etc. But if you want to do it quickly on a drone or on a satellite or on this uh, lunar space uh, station or, or the lunar lander, <laughs> that's completely different because you need also power, you have big uh, limitations and so on. So reduction similar like in the hardware. In the hardware, the big devices, the expensive ones, etc., are big. And they should be simplified, miniaturized, like the mini pig schedule. So something similar is now necessary in terms of software at, the, at different levels, at the level of uh, data acquisition, at the level of data pre-processing and data processing, etc. So it's, and there is a, a lot of potential, a lot of work there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think you have given uh, plenty of uh, resources and ideas for for the teachers here to uh, then come back to the to their uh, classrooms and, uh, and experiment and and transmit to their students uh, some of the potential uh, activities that they can do with these detectors. 
Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Carlos. Uh, I don't know if there is still uh, one last comment from somebody. No, if not, uh, again, thank you very much. It was very, very useful, very motivating uh, to, uh, to to continue with this collaboration. And I hope, uh, yeah, this will this collaboration will grow over the years. Uh, we, to, together with Michael, we we have. Uh, we we really want to to push this and because we see the 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 value and I think uh, with the experience already with Danny David and and, and other other teachers I think I think we can we have uh, we can say that we have uh, motivated quite some students to 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 go uh, into technical uh, so thank you very much. Sure, no problem. Thank you for the opportunity and for organizing everything. Uh, I will send you a copy and anything, just uh, contact uh, Rafael or myself, whatever, and we should try to help you. Know. And ideas and any questions, yes, just let us know. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you very Thanks much. And hope to see you soon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you also, Michael and everyone. Yes. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Say, see you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye.